accessing library computer data. Hi and welcome to Captain's Dry Dock where it's not a full episode this time. This is more of a problem solving video for myself just to show you the steps I've taken to try and work out how to show off my phaser array effect like this. but show it from behind the brass etched material that I bought from Green Strawberry. Now, if you don't know, brass etching is a supplementary part you, you can buy for, as an addition to your factory made model. It adds a wealth of detail to that model and makes it closer to the studio representation of that design. However, the issue with brass etching, as you know, it's not see-through. So how on earth am I going to shine my LEDs for the phaser array lighting effect through the brass etching? So there's one or two things I could have done here. I could have just not used the brass etching and just had that phaser array effect light up. However, you don't get that awesome detail which is representative to the actual studio model. So I don't want to sacrifice either or of those elements to that phaser array effect. So what's my solution? Well, so I had to work this one out and it will have to come down to making it see-through. It sounds simple, but it's not. There's a process that goes on with that. So it means I've got to make a see-through version of the brass etching by making a way of a silicon mold and also clear cast resin. Anyway, let's engage. Step one, preparation. Now looking at the images of the studio model, it's clear the phaser array is raised and curved. Now I scraped all this raised detail from my model as I'm using Green Strawberry's detail brass etchings, which are a little bit more narrow. So this is where I'll need to work the metal and bend it into that lovely curve to mimic that form by using a brush handle. Being very gentle, I'm slowly pressing the brass into the handle to get that curved form again. Now I'm going to take my sweet time, as it's very difficult to undo unwanted creases in metal. Believe me, I've messed up many etchings in the past by rushing, as brass etchings are normally etched onto thin brass sheet. This will be an issue when mold making later on, as it will not provide the thickness that I require to have enough depth to make the mold. To solve this, I'm sticking the etching down onto high impact polystyrene, or in layman's terms, plastic card. Or to be precise, this is 0.75 millimeters thick plastic card, and I've used a nice thick UHU glue, which is basically an all purpose glue, which serves a couple of purposes. It sticks down two completely different materials together, and it will also fill up the hollow negative space that was created when making the curve. This will make these. The, this will make this part solid and thereby keep out the silicon when I do a pour and while it cures. Step 2. Making a box to pour the silicon. As these objects are so small, this will be really easy to do as I'm only going to make a single part mould. By that I mean there's only one silicon piece that I'll end up with. To make this, I've hot glued strips of plastic card around these parts making sure there's enough space around them. The parts themselves are stuck down to a bathroom tile with double sided sticky tape. This is so I can easily remove them later for use again just in case or if I want to use them on another model. As none of the surfaces have a grain and are super smooth, I can be cheeky and avoid the extra cost and expense of a, of a release agent. Step 3. Mixing the silicon. Perhaps the most expensive part of the process, the silicon. This silicon is very common online and used by amateurs and pros alike and the reason why it's so expensive is because it's bloody good. So to make the most of it and not waste any by mixing too much, a little mass will help me out. Measuring cups are not only sturdy so not to melt from the chemicals it contains but also are very useful because they got increments whereby if I know the volume of the box such as the one I've made I will then know how much is required. So to find the volume I'll need to multiply the length times the width times the depth of the box. So this is 15 centimeters by 10 centimeters by one centimeter. So I times those all together, which equals 150 centimeters cubed. But as I don't want to fill it up to the brim, I'll only pour around about, let's just say 125 centimeters cubed. Now for, now for the next maths equation. I need to pour in the correct amount of catalyst this is the ingredient required to cure the silicon, 
And now when I say cured, this is a term used when talking about chemical setting. So unlike clay, water-based paint and many glues which set and dry when exposed to air, this requires a catalyst which has to be precisely measured and mixed. In this case, 10% of the weight of the silicon should be the amount of catalyst poured. So an easy equation is 159 grams divided by 10. That's 15.9 grams of, uh, of catalyst that I need to use. So if I pour that into the silicon, the reading should be 174.9, which means I'll need to pour enough catalyst until the reading reads 174.9. But as these are the kitchen scales, which don't go down to one decimal place, I'll round it up to 175. Step 4. The pour. Once mixed, there's plenty of working time, so I don't need to rush, as I want to pour slowly and carefully, making sure to pour not on the object, but instead onto the base, so to let the silicon slowly rise up like the water in a bath, and avoid the dreaded air bubbles making surface contact to those parts. Ideally, it would be great to have a degassing chamber that sucks out the air bubbles or from the silicon before I pour. But as I can't justify buying such an expensive thing for something I rarely do, I can just get away with this on just such small parts. Here's a tip. To help encourage any air bubbles from the mould, give the box a little tap or rattle. It doesn't matter so much that you don't get all the air bubbles out, you just need to make sure that any sneaky ones aren't in direct contact with the objects you're making a mould from. With this particular silicon, it takes around about 12 hours to cure. Step 5. Casting. For this, I need to use clear cast, which does exactly what it says on the tin. It sets as a clear hard resin, which many model makers use for water effects. But I'll be using it so you can see my lighting effect. So with this product, I'll need to add a catalyst, which is around about 2% of the weight of the clear cast I require. Be warned, this stuff is very toxic and stinks to high heaven, so if you don't have a vapour mask, make sure your windows are wide open, or better yet, just do it outside, as this stuff will make your house smell like a meth lab, assuming meth labs smell like anything from the chemicals and Breaking Bad has taught me. Clear cast takes around about 20 to 40 minutes to cure into a jelly-like texture where it should be covered with cellophane. This is so to stop the air getting to it and help avoid it curing with a tacky texture. Now the big reveal. Has all this effort paid off? Well, as this voice recording is pre-recorded, then yes, it certainly has. Now if there's a theme to the whole process, it would be slow and steady. And there you have it, a clear phaser strip ready for installation. It feels slightly tacky, but the producers of this brand of clear cast recommend to leave it 7 days and use, also use neat washing up liquid to remove any residual tackiness. Step 6. RGB light strip installation. I'm almost there. After a week of making sure the cast is hardened and set, I've sanded down any rough bits and test fitted it with masking tape. I will be again using UHU all purpose adhesive rather than super glue as I want working time to make fine adjustments before it sets. And while I'm doing this I'm using masking tape to hold it all down as it sets. All I need to do is install the RGB light strip, but as this strip flexes only in one way, I need to add a kink in between each LED to reflect the curve of the source's phaser array, being really careful I don't damage or crack the connections. Once I've made sure it all fits, I need to cut the length to the right size and then update the Arduino code to let it know how many LEDs it's now using so to make the phaser array effect work. So I'm so sorry, that was meant to be a short video update which turned out to be a full on episode. As you can see, this was a highly challenging but worthwhile endeavour to include this effect into my D. Now this was all due to accidentally coming across Halo models and seeing that this effect is possible, which they used in their Enterprise E, and I've included the link to their website below. Now if you want this effect for your model, there's a few ways you can go about it. 
either buy a kit that yields similar results from a company I have list listed just down below with uh, the other links. However, this is incredibly expensive, especially if you live outside the United States, what with delivery charges. Or you can commission someone to come up with the Arduino code like I did, which is much, much cheaper. Now, if you don't mind waiting, I might make a detailed video of making electronics for this along with the code. Or better yet, I might make this as a product, especially after I've completed the model. So subscribe to this channel and keep an open eye for updates. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. I'll look forward to showing you the next progress video here on Captain's Dry Dock. Take care and remember, fate protects fools, little children and ships named Enterprise. Take care guys. Library computer data.